tell you a story. So we're in Wyoming, um, about 13,400 feet up on a mountain with two very, very dear friends of mine, one named Quinn, one named Jeremy. And they looked at me and said, are you content with your life? The Bible says we should be content. Are you happy with your life? Quinn looked straight in my eyes. And you got to understand, when you're 13,400 feet, it's already two below zero down there. So we're at about 25 below zero. Literally, wind blowing, nothing there, and there's no railing. We're just standing on the edge up there, just looking at God, you know. He said, are you content with your life? Are you content with what's going on in your life today? And Jeremy looked at me and he said, answer that question. That's a good question. Are you content? And I looked him dead straight in the eyes and I said, no, I'm not. And I'm ashamed of myself for it. They said, why? I said, I haven't reached as many people as I want to reach for God. I let other people still tell me how I can do things when I don't want to do them. I'm still not happy with the size of the congregation. And I'm still not happy, even though we've got all these millions of people watching now, I'm still not happy with that. Because if there's two million, I want five. If there's five, I'm going to want ten. If there's ten, I'm going to want twenty. Because that's serving God the right way. You always want to give more to God. And if anybody in this room, you know, the Bible says be content. I'm not content. I'm not happy. I'm happy with my life, obviously, but ministry work, I'm not happy. I'm not con I am not content with this. And Quinn looks at me and he said, then you've become complacent. And I had to look up the word. And uh, I didn't. Yeah, Linda goes, that's a big word. <clears throat> so I looked it up and complacent is that you're just happy with status quo. You know, you're just, whatever's going to be is going to be, and I'm just going to live it, and whatever, you know, it's just whatever. Just leave me alone and let me do my thing. And, you know, I, I don't need to get bigger. I don't need to get better. I don't need to get in shape. I don't need to make any old New Year's Eve resolutions again because all of them are already broke from January the 1st by 80% of the world. You, you become complacent. And you become complacent out of fear. Now, and then Quinn and Jeremy and I started praying. And this is the gospel truth. It's 20 to 30 below zero. I prayed so hard that I literally had to take off my hat to cover my ears. And I took off my coat because I was sweating. 30 below zero, 13,400 feet up on a mountain, I started sweating. And then I quit praying and I got cold. And I thought, why am I cold? Quinn looked at me and he goes, because you became lukewarm. This is a true story. I became lukewarm. And I looked down at, and I thought, I'm looking down at the bottom of the mountain, and I thought, I can't imagine being more ashamed of myself than I was at that moment. Look at Jeremy and Quinn. I couldn't imagine being more ashamed of myself for letting other people dictate how I do what I do when I want to do it for this ministry and for God. I am ashamed of myself for status quo. I'm ashamed of myself. Quinn looked at me, and he point blank said, and Quinn is, well, he's probably three or four years older than Pastor Carter, earthwise, you know. And, uh, he looks at me and he goes, I think you're getting it. He goes, I think you're getting it. Because when we become complacent with what we have, we become lazy. We become expectant that, you know, whatever happens, happens. And I'm just not geared that way. I, I'm not geared that way. So this morning I came in, and by the way, for the people out there watching, I did a TikTok video, <laughs> social media. They got, this was yesterday, I think it's at, Vicki, 84, 85,000 people. Yeah, which just amazes me that that many people would want to hear me. But I said in the TikTok video, I'm like, all you people fill these stadiums in these football games. It's snowing. It's five degrees outside. They're showing pictures of people's cans of beer frozen and overflowing. And some guy, you know, there's always that one in the crowd who takes his shirt off and starts, woo, go team. 
They're out there in five degree weather, which is probably 15 below zero, drinking beer with their shirt off, watching a football game. But it was 39 degrees below zero wind chill this morning when you guys walked in this church. They can go to a football game and a lot of people can sit at home and say, oh, it's too cold. Let me tell you how cold it really truly is. It's cold from your front door to your car. It's cold from your car to the parking lot to the front door. Because right now it's 75 degrees and sunny in here, as Joe Nichols would say. I don't buy excuses as to why you can't come to church. If you can sit out in the cold in a football game and drink beer and watch cheerleaders and go, yay, you can get your butt inside of a church and praise an almighty God. So I started thinking about, I got here this morning, and I started thinking about change. And so I wrote down some stuff. By the way, before I forget, we're missing some people because they're sick. So Steve and Melody, we're praying for you guys. Teresa, we're praying for you that you feel better. Jeremy, is that your son's name? Brandon, yeah, Jeremy. Brandon, safe trips back to Florida, brother. Keep praising God. Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. See, this verse reminds us that God is always at work, bringing about change and transformation in our, in our bodies. Even in the wilderness and even in the wastelands of our life, God is making a way and providing refreshments for our soul. And it encourages us to open up new things God is doing and to trust that he is leading us towards that new growth and transformation. God tells us in this scripture, I am doing a new thing. You can teach an old dog new tricks. You can get bigger and better at anything you want to do. The problem with people today is your own person. You get entitled to what you think you have. You get entitled to the life that you have. You think that you're entitled to wake up. You're not. You're not promised to wake up. You think you're entitled because you have this or you have that. The only thing that you should feel entitled about is that that guy died on that cross and that guy up there sacrificed his son so that we could be in this church at 38 below praising his holy name and talking about what it means to change your life for the better, to do better, not to be complacent, but to improve in every aspect of your life to glorify God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Corinthians 5.17, one of my probably five best favorite scriptures. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has become. The old one is gone, the new is here. <clears throat> through Christ, through Christ, we are made new. This verse speaks to the transformation power of Christ. How anything and everything is possible if you put God first. My beautiful wife, what's her name again? Cindy. My beautiful wife, Cindy, put a post up on our anniversary. And she said that a marriage only works if there's three involved. God, the husband, and the wife. That is what this is. God has to be the center of everything that you do. God has to be the center of the ministry. God has to be the center of every single person in here and every single person out there. God has to be the center of everything. And, and I know, <laughs> oh boy can talk, can he? So I know people are sitting around at their kitchen table sometimes drinking wine and a Miller beer going, oh, that pastor, he just talks. He knows how to talk. That pastor just knows how to talk. You're daggone right I know how to talk because he gave me the power to evangelize in his name to glorify him to get people to that daggone cross so that we can change this world back to what it was even 40 years ago. It's not impossible because the Bible teaches us with God everything is possible. you got to want the want. you got to get up on that horse and not accept 
a slow ride. You got to kick him in the side and let that son of a buck go and ride him hard. And it's time to start riding hard again. It's time to get on the saddle. It's time to not fear getting bucked off because of fear. You got to get up, you got to ride, and you can't care about what the consequences are because we're riding for the brand. We're riding for God. Romans 12.2. You excited yet? Do not conform the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. God's will. God's will. God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transformation within yourself begins with the renewing of our minds. What does that mean, Pastor? Funny you should ask. Let me just put it this way. Get over yourselves. Everybody that thinks they're better than somebody else needs to be knocked on the kneecaps and put on their knees and get their hands up and start praising God. Because the Lord giveth and the Lord can taketh just like that. And if you don't think it, ask people that don't have what they had yesterday when they woke up this morning, whether it's life or property. Ask them how powerful God is. Ask the people that sit at home and drink and come to church thinking that people don't know. People know. Ask them. Ask them what God does in their life. How do you change your life? Quit being fake. Just stop being fake. If you're going to serve God, serve Him. But do it with everything you got. Because the consequences, Lucy, are severe. They're severe. This verse reminds us, where am I at? That's me breathing. This verse highlights the importance of aligning our thoughts with God's will, which leads to growth in a deeper understanding on what God's plans are for our lives. And if you think that you can't improve your life, now you're complacent again. Same thing that Quinn and Jeremy and I were talking about on the mount. Then you became complacent. And then there is no room for growth because you won't allow it. You won't allow that growth to take place because now you think you're holier than thou. Now you think you're better than anybody. Now you think that your poop doesn't stink because you're setting up higher because you make a little more money. You drive a nicer vehicle. You think you've got friends who actually can't stand you, but they're afraid to tell you. See, that's the, the, the life that we live. That's that circle that people live in. We get so full of ourselves, we forget to praise who can change our lives. And it's God. God can change your life. He can change it before you walk out that door right now. And the fact is, you want to hear something really cool? He wants to do it. He wants to change your life. Am I echoing really bad? A little bit. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this, the who that he who began a good work in your will carry it out to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God is not finished with you. Pastor Carter turned 80 on the 11th. He still got at least another 12, 13 years that he can improve. God's not done yet. God's not done with any of us yet. He still wants to see growth at any age. God wants us to all Become better disciples, which is Latin for the word learner. God wants us to become more learned of His Son. He wants us to understand Him more, to follow Him more. And the Bible says in two scriptures back, and learn His pleasing will. You want to please God? Do something unexpected for Him. Make Him smile today. Put a smile on God's face today. Because if you don't think God can smile, you don't know God. Because God is everything and every emotion. So God can smile and laugh. Make God smile upon you today. Do something unexpected to make God smile. Charlie, you're in deep thought. Did I say something for, you know, Charlie's sitting over there going, 
I got to do a Charlie face for TV. You just got to be here live. Colossians 3.10. And now we put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the center of the Creator. As followers of Christ, we have been given a new identity in our own lives. This verse encourages us to embrace our new selves, which are constantly being renewed and transformed by growing in knowledge in the likeness of our Creator. What does that mean? It, see, here's the thing. Satan says don't. God says do. Satan says you can't. God says you can. Satan says you won't. God says you will. Satan says it's impossible. God said it's possible. Satan said sit. God said get up off your butt and go do it. But most people want to be an armchair quarterback and sit back and go, this is the greatest thing in the world. How come he didn't see him open from 30 yards? He's open 30 yards, nobody around him. You don't have a 300-pound lineman coming at you wanting to bury you in the dirt either in two seconds. Don't judge something that's not you. So don't live your life based on what you think about other things. Base your life on you. Because you can't help you until you get yourself straight with God. Then when you're straight, then you can go out and help everybody else get straight. Amen? Work on you from the inside. Work on you from your heart. The Bible teaches us that Satan's greatest weapon is the tongue of a man or a woman. Because you can destroy people. You, people have literally committed suicide over people's tongues. You have people with their stupid tongues can cause families to separate and can cause business to close. We live in an age where if you don't like something, you can go tick, 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 like a, like a, a coward, because that's all internet people are, cowards when they start writing stuff. You can ruin somebody's life. Why? That's how, you know why people do that? Because they're not, they're not sold on themselves yet. And they're not sold on God yet. The Bible says for us to follow what the Creator's will is for us. I promise you, God doesn't want people to go after other people. God wants us to go treat people equally and go try to improve their lives on a daily basis. That makes for a better world, amen? And by the way, people, that's Scripture. Ephesians 4, 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be God in true righteousness and holiness. Our old selves, with their deceitful desires, must be put off as we embrace a new life in Christ. See, it doesn't matter if you repent your sins truthfully, like King David did. He got favor with God, not because of his verses, not because of his heart solely, but because of his pure heart when he repented. It was pure, and God knew it was pure. If you repent and ask God to forgive you, God is not going to look down on you and go, yeah, but. He may still test you occasionally and make sure that that's right, that you really want that, or that you're sincere, but God's going to give you that new heart. He's going to give you that new life. He's going to give you that new love, that new joy. He's going to give you that passion that it takes to serve Him. And to serve God correctly, you have to do what the Apostle said, to preach with vigor and enthusiasm. That's biblical. Vigor and enthusiasm. It's called evangelism. Amen? The verse emphasizes the dual process of letting go of old patterns and attitudes and actively taking on the character in God and of God. Can you imagine taking on the character of God? Could you imagine walking the earth with God? Because when I was up on that mountain, I felt God right beside me. I felt Him beside me. I felt chills, and I sweated, and I felt ashamed. And then I felt joy. And the joy came because of this, as we were coming down the mountain. I'm not dead. 
Ask me why. I'm afraid of heights. I'm surprised I didn't have a heart attack up there. I'm literally afraid of heights. So to get me up that high was an act of God in itself. I fly. And I have a panic attack just about every time the plane starts doing this, doing that, doing that, coming down, landing, bump, bump. I hate it. Like, I have the worst fear of heights in the world of fear of heights. And of course, where do they put me? Window seat. All four. Yeah. Guess how many people asked me to trade places? None. None. Yeah, that's just the way it is in my house. <laughs> Psalms 51.10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Change and growth begins with a humble heart. This verse is a prayer of transformation. Acknowledging our need for God to create in us a clean heart and a steadfast spirit. It reminds us that true, true change comes from within ourselves, but is based on the promises and commitments from an almighty God that he will accept us into his home. One day, I am going to die. And when I die, my one regret right now is this. And this is from my heart. I don't care about being in prison. I don't care about being sexually molested. I don't care about being stabbed. I don't care about having my head shaved and beat up. I don't care about that stuff. That, that made me the man I am today. That's a fact. You don't like it. That's too bad. The one thing that I would regret today is that I settled. I settled. And for that again, I'm ashamed of myself. That's going to change. But when you read this scripture, and we read what it says, how many people can honestly take a deep look within themselves right now and really look in your heart Really search for what God wants you and for you and can tell me that you're content. Are you content or is there more? Is there more that you can do to serve God? Is there more that you can do to change people's lives to get them to the cross? Is there more? Because if we're breathing, and we are, if we died before we walked out that door, and there's a possibility, we're not promised it, but if we did, what would be your one regret? Because here's the thing, everybody in here, let me make sure. Okay, everybody in here is still alive. So everybody in here still can change. She pinches Charlie. What, what, what the heck? She literally, she, I go, everybody in here is alive. She went, are you alive, Charlie? All right, Charlie's alive. Now we can continue. So, if you knew that you were going to walk out this door, and that's as far as you're going to get in life, what would your one regret be? I want you to really think about that question. What would your one regret be? Change it. Don't make it a regret. Make it something you conquered. See, we have the power given and instilled in us by an almighty God the power to change our lives any time we want. All we have to do is get on our knees and praise that man. Get on our knees and praise that man. That's all we have to do. And then change comes. Then the regrets leave. The regrets are over. And somebody told me one time, I can never change and I can never move forward because I hurt so many people. And they're just never going to accept me for who I am and they're never going to forgive me. You know what my answer was? Who cares? Who cares if they forgive you? You need to care about if your repentance was true. You need to care. Look, it's 40 below zero outside and I'm burning it. You need to worry about your repentance being true to God. You need to worry about, did you acknowledge your sins individually or as a whole? Pray to God, forgive me for the sins that I've done and the ones that I don't know I've done. And if you're sincere with it, that's all you need. 
You don't need to go knock on your neighbor's door and go, do you forgive me? Well, they didn't forgive me. How do I live my life now? Well, if you're living your life that way because you're concerned somebody didn't forgive you, you're not living your life for Christ. Who cares? We care about what he thinks, what he does for our life. Not just because Charlie brought me fried crappie this morning. That means, <laughs> yes, I get in this morning, and I get, I get food. Rita brought me food. John brought me Jared's sausage. He brought me fried crappie. I need to leave, and I'll get fat. Psalms. Let's go to the next one. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put on new spirit in you. I will remove you from the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. See, in our own strength, change may seem impossible to you. But this verse assures us that God has the power to give us new hearts and new spirits. He can transform the hardest of hearts and transform the people that resist him the most into soft and responsive ones. Ones that can actually, by the testimonial of their hard times, go out and change more people's lives. But you've got to be willing to accept that change is going to come. Now here's why a lot of people don't want to change. One, well I've got all this. What happens if, if I have to get rid of it? You know, why don't you go back in time and find out what the guy said when, G when he asked Jesus, what do I got to do to follow you? He said, sell everything. He said, I can't do that. You know, I'm a wealthy guy. My daddy gave me everything. I'm not going to go sell it. Do you think that guy's in heaven today based on that situation with Jesus? Don't be afraid to give up what you need to give up to get what you eventually will get. And what is that, you might ask? Funny you should ask. Welcome in my good and faithful servant. There is nothing on this earth worth this response. I do not know you. Go away. So what would you rather have? Welcome in, my good and faithful servant. Your family's up elevator number three to the left. They're waiting on you. Or, sorry bud, don't know who you are, but the rest of the family that was like you, they're down the elevator to the right. It's your choice. Literally, it's your choice. You're still breathing. You're still alive. Make the choice to serve God today. Get rid of your anger. I know there's a lot of people with anger problems. What does that solve? Anger can lead to bitterness. Bitterness leads to strife. Strive leads to people getting upset with each other. It leads medically, they say, can lead to heart problems, heart disease, cancer, you know, anxiety, and could just make you a miserable person. Who gets off by being angry? Satan. He loves it when people are mad at each other. He absolutely loves it when people yell at each other and they start a conflict. Because that's him at his best. God at his best is like, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. Amen? James 1.22 Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Biblical. Change and growth requires action. It's not enough to simply hear or read the Word of God. We must pick it out and practice it. This verse challenges us to live out our faith and align our actions with what we believe. It is in doing what we experience in the transformation to become as close to Christ-like as we can. How do you do that? It's really simple. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. Got a true story. Knew a guy that won the lottery. He was an executive for Marathon Oil in Robinson, Illinois. At the, this, was, this would have been in the mid-80s. I was like three, but I remember this vividly. Not true. I was out of high school. But I, I used to, to fish with him and his son. And uh, he's an executive at Marathon Oil. He won the Illinois Lottery. $28 million. Thought he had it all. 
put, did, didn't put his two-week notice into work. He called him and said, hey, I won the lottery. I'm leaving. I don't ever need to work again. And he was a really nice guy, and his family was really good family. So he quits his job at Marathon Oil, decides this is life. This is everything I ever wanted. He went and bought a big bass boat, and for the next two summers, that's why he did. He fished. What a life, right? Then he started drinking more. And then the more he drank, the more he was going out without his wife. And then he was taking flights. And then he was taking flights that weren't his wife. And then he got divorced. Six years. He filed for bankruptcy, and he was divorced. His wife didn't want to have anything to do with him. Took six years, $28 million to flat broke, and this is an honest-to-God true story. He went back to Marathon. They wouldn't hire him because he didn't give his two weeks' notice when he quit. Right? He delivered pizzas. He went from an executive at Marathon to an Illinois lottery winner to a pizza delivery person in six years. So if you think you have it all, you may be delivering pizzas at Papa John's soon. Because it only takes one lawsuit. It only takes one thing to happen in your life. To have it all, to have lost it all. But, if you had it all, and you lost it, and then you put God in your life, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be like Job, and you're going to get more than you had the first time. But if you have it all, and you had God, you wouldn't have lost it. Your choice. How do you want to live your life? With God, being appreciative, being humble, and knowing that just like that, it can all be taken. Just like that. Or do you want to be, I'm holier than thou, I've got it, you don't, I'm going to act like I do because you don't, and then watch what happens when you fall. Nobody's going to come to your rescue because you made too many enemies. And down there in the dirt is where you're going to make the greatest decision of your life. You're going to say, Lord, rescue me. I'm yours. I'm your servant. Or you're going to be mad at God, and then you're going to stay in the dirt. Choose to ask to be rescued. Let God take control of your life. Roll the film. Let God continue to be God. Psalms 119.105 Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light of my path. God's word served as our guide and our source of wisdom as we navigate the journey of change and growth. This verse reminds us that when we align our lives with the truth of Scripture, we will lead the right and be led down the right direction. It emphasizes the importance of seeking God's wisdom and his knowledge throughout the world. God wants us to always seek him. He wants us to be knowledgeable in his word. Those things benefit us in life. Everybody should want to change this world. This world is messed up. I am afraid of my children and grandchildren growing up the way the world is right now. Everybody's entitled. Everybody wants to go fight a fight they don't even know anything about. They just want to be involved. Well, go be involved in your local church so that they'll quit being shut down. Go be involved in your local church and serve God so that he'll save this God-forsaken world. Go get involved in your own house so that your kids aren't drug addicts and alcoholics and 13-year-olds aren't walking down downtown Atlanta carrying a Glock in their white t-shirt going around killing people because they had to be initiated into a gang at 13 because they needed a family. Be a parent. Be a servant. Be a person that wants to be godly. Watch this world change. But you've got to start to change within yourself. You've got to want it more than anybody, anybody wants it for you. You've got to want it. And today, sometime, sometime today, do something unexpected for God. Make Him smile. Make Him smile. And i got something else I want to say. Ministry 
aspects are going really, really good. And my daughter, who you know, Kelsey Lane, Kelsey Lane has decided to take a semester off of school so that she can do nothing but help in the ministry, help with all the social media, help with all of that other stuff. She is a semester and a half away from a master's. How far? A bachelor's, a semester away from a bachelor's, going for a master's. She is going to take the time out. Kelsey Lane is taking the time out to sacrifice that to help with the social media aspect of what I've been doing. That's sacrifice, guys. And I'm going to give her a round of applause for it. People ask me, and I've heard this before, I don't, I don't rate sermons that I've ever done. I rate it by reaction of people. I did one sermon one time, believe it or not, on a Wednesday night where the mayor was in, in the audience, and he cried. And, he, and I left there feeling chills. This was about seven or eight years ago. Maybe long, 10 years maybe. Pennsylvania, 12 years? Maybe 12 years. Um, and I had chills when I left the church that day. The only other time I've ever felt like that was in this church. I preached, and if you guys didn't know it, Kelsey Lane immediately turned the TV off and cried and went to the bathroom. Cindy had to go in the bathroom and console her because of what I was speaking about in the sermon. See, that's affirmation that God's in this house. That means God is touching people in this house. That's church, people. That's church. When you have sacrifice for the betterment of the ministry, that is church. I asked, I'm going to end this, but I asked about a month ago or so, how many people know one person that they could bring to church with them? I don't care if you have to grab them by the shirt tails and say, you're, Vicki, bribe them. You're a good cook. Tell them, look, I'm going to cook you a good, what, what are you, what's your favorite meal that you cook? Okay, Vicki is going to make chicken and noodles for every one of her friends that will come to church next Sunday. But you have to come to church before you get them, right? Austin makes good smoked wings, I hear. So all of Austin's friends that are, well, do your friends even listen? They could. If any of Austin's friends are out there listening, he's going to provide you with home-delivered smoked chicken wings. Fair? If you come to church, but you can't get them until you come to church. Ted, what do you, Ted can build anything. So if you need something fixed, Ted's going to fix it. But you have to come to church first. Bernie can fix vehicle. Bernie, any, anybody needs any vehicle fixed, tractor, four-wheeler, Bernie will fix it. Free. Pay for the parts. But you've got to come to church first. And as for me, I can't do nothing. I am preach a little bit. So you come to church and I'll preach for you. And I would tell you that my wife will cook for you, but then you'd never come back. I'm going to lose more weight. <laughs> this is church. God was here right now. He would say, boom.